So we always like to start with our mission and vision. Obviously, uh, Journey Center uh, for Safety and Healing, you'll hear me refer to it as Journey Center, provides services that foster safety and healing to those affected by child abuse and domestic violence. We want to prevent that abuse through education, advocacy, and systemic change. We envision a community where safety and well-being are achieved by empowering people to find a path towards healthy, thriving relationships. So let's talk a little bit about therapy. Um, we provide individual therapy. We do not do family therapy. Sometimes that's a question, but we do do individual therapy for adults and children who are aged four and older. That age four, it's a little arbitrary in the fact that we can, it depends on the cognitive abilities of the child. If they're good for therapy at four, we'll do it at four or, or a little bit older. And we do it for individuals who want treatment for childhood abuse or domestic violence. Um, the abuse can be physical. It can be sexual, emotional, um, we have the domestic violence. We have witnessing violence in the home. We also do um, therapy for stalking, harassment, those type of things as well. Our staff are experts in the field of violence and abuse and receive extensive training in those um, subjects. We're also staffed in evidence-based practices, which is essential for trauma services. So some of the modalities that we are trained in um, it kind of sounds like alphabet soup. You'll hear TFCBT, which is trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR, eye movement, desensitization reprocessing. There's expressive art techniques. There's also a few more that later on in the Lunch and Learn we'll, we'll get into with a little bit more specifics. And then we're also contracted to the Child Advocacy Center of Cuyahoga County, which is called Canopy. We have therapists who are contracted with them to provide therapy to children who were subjected to sexual abuse and human trafficking. We will also be starting to see children who have experienced physical abuse and those who um, have issues with problematic sexualized behavior. So we also have advocacy in the trauma services department, which is very important. Our community advocate for trauma services addresses all of the additional supports that clients need in the form of resources and training. It can be education. Um, it can be connecting them to resources in the community to get basic needs met. The advocate com um, completes in-person assessments based on what that individual needs. So they will meet with them. They'll discern what it is that we can help them with, and then they'll help them move forward with achieving those goals. Some of them are income and employment, housing, transportation, um, health care, child care, uh, legal uh, questions, not that we are experts in the legal field, but legal questions. We have substance use, physical health, and the list goes on and on with those resources. So what do we do in trauma therapy? So our main goal is to assist clients to reduce the impact of trauma that they have had so that their emotional and their well-being their mental well-being, their functioning is at a healthy level. So we want to help them develop coping skills and give them an increased understanding about trauma and the impacts and the effects that it can have on them. Services that we provide, we do outpatient individual services, as I mentioned. Um, we do do group services we have in the past. We do it for children and for adults. Right now, we do not have any groups going. We just completed a support group, um, and we'll be implementing those um, group therapy sessions starting in the near future. Our groups are usually closed and there's limited space. We like to keep them closed for confidentiality and rapport purposes. Some group topics can include um, coping, emotional regulation, child trauma therapy, um, yoga, life skills, um, domestic violence education, the type of things that they're occurring or experiencing in everyday life. We then have our individual therapy. We do in-person sessions. We also do virtual sessions, also called telehealth, whichever is going to be best for the client. For some of the kids, we meet them in the community as well. Frequency is weekly. We like to see our clients every week. That can kind of start to diminish or dwindle down to once every other week as they start to meet those goals when their symptoms have kind of become regulated or when they're getting closer to discharge. No crisis services are offered in the department. So if somebody is experiencing an immediate crisis, we are able to provide them with resources of who they can call should they need that in between their sessions. What is the process for entering our therapy services? Well, as we mentioned, you have to meet the criteria. So children who are cognitively able to do so at four years of old or older, and it's someone who has witnessed, experienced, or been exposed to domestic violence, child abuse, or any other type of interpersonal trauma. What would happen is they would call our helpline. Journey's helpline is 
4357. It's much easier for me to remember for it is 216-391-HELP. And they'll do a brief intake with one of our specialists on that helpline. What'll happen is at the moment we are on a wait list for services, but that referral will come over to myself. They'll be placed on the wait list. When that wait list spot is open, they're assigned to a therapist who will reach out to schedule them. They'll come in, they'll do intake paperwork, start an assessment, develop a treatment plan with goals with that assigned therapist so that then they can start those weekly sessions to start working on what they need. Our approach is a trauma-informed approach and it's, it's you would think that it would be something that everybody would do, but it's not. So trauma-informed care is really where you're shifting your focus. You may have heard this before, from what's wrong with you to what's happened to you, right? So something has happened to cause these symptoms. Something has happened to cause these reactions. And we really want to be trauma-informed and look at it from that perspective, as opposed to saying to somebody, what is wrong with you? Why are you acting like this? Why are you doing that? We want to get to the root cause of what's causing them to have these reactions. So we look at the six guiding pr principles of trauma-informed care. Safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, cultural, historical, and gender issues. And all of these really come together to inform us of what that trauma-informed care should look like. We have to be able to have these with not only clients, but with peers so that we're able to provide that environment for the clients. There's also four R's that are known as the trauma-informed approach. We want to realize, recognize, respond, and then very important is re, it's kind of a double R, isn't it? But resist re-traumatization. Sometimes we think what has to happen is someone needs to come in and they need to just kind of word vomit all of the trauma that they've been through. We have to remember that we're not here to re-traumatize. We're here to help regulate. And there's a difference in that. Continuing with our approach, we do look at it from a strengths perspective, as well as from an individual perspective. So we use an eclectic approach to clients because every client is different. So we have to find a modality or a type of therapy that's going to work for each client and because each client is different. So whatever fits best for them is what we're going to go with. As I mentioned, we are client-centered. We are strength-based. We only used evidence-based treatments and evidence-based treatments are those treatments that have been identified in the field that have been researched to show that when they fidelity is followed of the model, then they're able to produce those results. We do play interventions with children. We do art expressive interventions. And then our overall trauma approach brings clients in and encourages them to go at the pace that they need. And then we're able to work through their individual issues and the time frame that allots for them. As I mentioned, all of our therapists are trained in evidence-based practices, um, and here are a few as listed, we mentioned before, but we'll go over a couple more of these. Um, all of our therapists are trained in one, if not all of these. So a trauma-focused approach. We're going to look at the type of trauma and the length of trauma. What is going on? Unfortunately, trauma doesn't usually come on its own. Very rarely do we have an incidence of one traumatic event. Trauma sometimes feeds off a of trauma and you can have historical trauma, you can have generational trauma, systemic trauma. There's so many things that go into it that create complex and chronic trauma. So when we're working with a client, we have to remember there's just not always, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg analogy, what we're seeing and then what's happening underneath there. We do meet the client where they are. We also have to work with that client in meeting their basic needs. And we'll talk about that in just a second, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs is super important. We have to establish that the client is safe and that their basic needs are met in order for them to even begin to start working on their trauma. If somebody is trying to work through a basic need or is in an unsafe situation, it's very difficult for them and also unsafe for them to try to work through that trauma. So we really like to meet the clients where they are. We have to build that foundation, make sure that they are solid and supported, and then we work through that trauma. Because of that, we don't have a time limit on our length of treatment. You may hear some agencies, you get you know five sessions, you get 13 sessions, you get eight sessions, you get three months, whatever it might be. We don't have a time limit on it because 
for trauma, it really does take years to understand and work through the impacts that that trauma has on an individual. That's not to say that everybody will be in services for years. That's hardly the case. But what it does mean is that we're not giving you a time limit. We're going to work through it at your pace and make sure that you're addressing the underlying, the, your underlying needs and what's causing that trauma so those reactions are not as elevated and your functioning is not as impaired. I had mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and this is what I was talking about. Some of you may have heard of it, but it, what it's saying is we have to be good at our foundation, right? We have to have our basic needs met before we can move on to our safety needs. And once those are met, we can then move on to loving and belonging, esteem, and self-actualization, as you can see here. And there's, this is a whole philosophy of thinking, but Maslow are, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is essential to make sure that our clients are grounded, supported, and their needs are met before we start that trauma approach. We did talk a little bit about the evidence-based models. So some that we practice in the trauma services department, I will try and say the names and not just the alphabet soups for you, but it's trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as TFCBT, Eye movement desensitization reprocessing, EMDR. It's a big buzzword right now with those working with PTSD. We do cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. We do dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. Motivational interviewing, narrative processing, also narrative therapy, or cognitive processing therapy, which is called CPT. So you have to be trained and in the interventions, you have to have a lot of consultation, you have to be skilled and competent in the modality to use it. And that's really important. So just because somebody might be trained in it doesn't mean they're competent in it. So we have to make sure that all of the therapists are trained, skilled, and competent in order to move forward with the modalities. I'm gonna take this time to just kind of briefly explain two modalities that are kind of the gold standard at the time um, with the interventions that are being, being used for children and adults. So a big one for kiddos is TFCBT, and that is for children aged three to 18 years old. And it kind of goes with this acronym PRACTICE, and I'll briefly just explain those for you. So parenting and psychoeducation. You wanna teach and reinforce skills to parents so that they can do these things with their child at home. Having somebody with you once a week is great, but it doesn't have the same effect and benefit if you're doing things with them at home. So teaching and reinforcing skills for parents and then normalizing what that child is experiencing due to the exposure to trauma is imperative. Unfortunately, we'll hear a lot of times from parents, well, the same type of trauma happened to me and I didn't respond that way. Everybody's different, right? We have to normalize the exposure to trauma and the reactions that follow so that it is something that's not looked upon as maybe not truthful or not worth seeking services for. Relaxation skills, we teach those. Those are imperative. We have to deregulate we have to de-escalate the dysregulation that's occurring from the trauma. Affect expression and modulation. So this is feelings identification, working through how thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are intertwined and how when we change one, we change the other. This is talking about feelings, the intensity of feelings, and then how to bring them down, kind of like those coping skills. Cognitive coping kind of brings that all together. Again, we have a triangle, it's called the CBT triangle. Thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, we talk about how one affects the other and then what cognitive distortions are. So sometimes kiddos will be exposed to sexual abuse and they have a cognitive distortion that it may have been their fault. So we work through those. The T in practice is the trauma narration and processing. This is where we do talk about the trauma, including the worst parts of it, the worst moments. This can be done in multiple ways. It's not just with a child having to sit there. And remember when we were talking about trauma-informed care, we don't want them to re-traumatize them, right? We really want to resist that. But that doesn't mean that there aren't ways to get that information to come out. It can be done in a myriad of ways. So they can do painting, they can do poetry, they can do music lyrics, they can do face painting, right? There are many ways that we can have the child talk about their trauma so that they're able to process it. We really want to get them to walk away with the fact that trauma does not define them. This is something that may have happened to them it is not who they are. And then we move on to the I, which is in vivo mastery. This is where we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna kind of take that seamless, seems to us seamless fear away from the actual or perceived danger. So this is slowly 
it's kind of like exposure therapy, slowly putting that child into a situation that they feared before where there is no real harm. So another example of that would be, let's say for instance, there was an abusive situation that took place in a restroom. Now that child is afraid to enter into a restroom. So you'll slowly take them into that restroom without the real danger being there until they're able to master that. We also then have conjoint sessions. This is where you go ahead and that child has the opportunity to share their narrative with their caregiver, as long as that caregiver is a healthy caregiver. So this is a great way for the two to start talking about it, where it's not taboo or something that the family doesn't talk about or that we don't address. This is a way for the child to express their feelings to the caregiver and the caregiver to understand where that child is coming from. As a side note, we always... Um, talk to the caregiver about the narrative beforehand so that they are not caught off guard and they're prepared with their responses for the child. And then we want to enhance safety and future development. We always create a safety plan for ongoing dangers and dangers that could present themselves again. Unfortunately, we know that trauma does not live in a vacuum. And if you've been traumatized once, that's it, you're done. It doesn't work that way. So we want to make sure that the family in its entirety is safe should something again present itself real important in the TFCBT, we want to make sure that we're normalizing sexual behavior and development to counter any negative experiences that may have that may have happened. So normal development, normal sexual development is healthy. And we want to make sure that that's not getting intermingled with perhaps some of the negative experiences of abuse that happened, especially around sexual abuse. We always teach boundaries. That's imperative and important as well. And this is something that should be done throughout the entirety of of the practice, right? We should be talking about these things. We should be normalizing. We should be validating. And we should be having those con conjoint sessions when they're needed. So you're always checking in with the parent, knowing the, so they know what y'all worked on so that it's able to be implemented at home. So that's just a quick synopsis of TFCBT. And then we have EMDR. Again, remember that's eye desensitization reprocessing. Um, Eye movement, I'm sorry, desensitization reprocessing. And this is a modality that's used for eight children aged four and then adults. So four and up is what we use this for. And this is a real gold standard. It's a buzzword right now for PTSD as well. There are kind of eight protocols of EMDR, if you will. Um, there's history taking where you get a history background. You want to get the memories from the client that's actually impairing they're functioning, right? So it could be something I'm remembering this thing that happened to me, or I have a memory of doing this, whatever the memory is that's causing them impairment. And you also want to find out what their future goals are. Then you begin to prepare the client. You prepare them by explaining what you're going to be doing. A lot of times, because there's actually some movement with this, if you will. It's called bilateral stimulation. You may have also heard it called tapping. You're going to explain what it does and why you're doing it. So there's different ways to do bilateral stimulation. So you want to see what the preferences are of your client. It can be audio. It can be visual. It can be physical. So you want to explain it, what it is, and make sure that they're comfortable with, with it. You'll also do assessing, right? We want to go ahead and see how distressed they are, how distressed they are when they start and when they finish. And then we want to figure out their validity of cognition. How, how well, I guess, are they believing the thoughts that they're having about the memory or about their future goals? And then we start that desensitization processing. What this is, this is really kind of your meat and potatoes of the modality. You're going to focus on the memory that you are, that's affecting you, that's impairing you. And you, while that memory is being focused on, bilateral stimulation is being given. That client is then going to report what they thought of while that was happening. And then they're going to go ahead and go with that thought while you repeat the process. So the process continues until the client no longer has that memory as being a distressing memory. This is not something that can happen, typically happens in one session. This happens over time. These are just kind of the eight basic steps we're running down for you. So once that memory is no longer distressing, we do something called installation. And so what this is, is we're going to strengthen that positive cognition while doing that bilateral, bilateral stimulation. We then do a body scan, ask the client to observe any type of physical response that they might be having or thinking about or that they're having while they're thinking about that memory. And we're going to see if any Thing holds in their body physically. If it does, we're going to try and do more bilateral stimulation to relieve that 
physiological um, reaction that they're having. And then we have something called closure. This is where that target, we have the targeted memory where they started, the one that was kind of, I always call it like a hot, a hot topic, a hot tar target. Um, we want to see if that has been fulfilled. If it's not, which again, doesn't always happen in a session, there's specific instructions and techniques that are used to make sure that we leave it where it is. So the work that we've done to make that memory hot less hot, I should say. We wanna make sure that we're containing it so that when we come back, we can pick up where we left off and continue to work through these steps until we get somebody that's no longer experiencing distress with that memory. And then we reevaluate um, and do what we need to do to start the, set, the process over again to work through all of those. This is a great way, it's kind of this chart, which is a little bit easier to see, if you will. So it just kind of works you through it. You do your history and treatment planning. That's where we talk about what's going on, the memories, prepare them, explain the techniques, which way they'd like to receive the bilateral stimulation. You do this, how distressed they are. You assess their cognitions. You work through the bilateral stimulation. You install the good memory, body scan to make sure there's no residual effects, close it and reevaluate. It's a very, very, very quick synopsis of a very um, detailed and intricate uh, modality. Some other types of evidence-based practices or interventions that we use are CBT, that's cognitive behavioral therapy, and that works to change unhealthy thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. I like to look at you, imagine it's a triangle. They're all interconnected. Changing one changes all of them. Uh, the dialectical behavioral therapy, this works to help clients not change their thoughts so much, but accept them and then manage the intense reaction that they may have to them. This is especially good for people with borderline personality disorder, um, suicidality, and self-harm. So we're kind of sitting in it, right? Um, this, is, this is what I say, sitting in the sucks. This is where we're going to sit in that and just kind of manage those thoughts and feelings. Motivational interviewing works with those who aren't sure what they're trying to obtain out of therapy. Narrative therapy kind of puts the problem back into the client so that they can review and rewrite their story. And then cognitive processing is trauma specific and asks you to evaluate and change adverse thoughts about trauma. Clients are ready to be discharged when they choose. Um, when their treatment plan is done, they can be discharged, unfortunately, if they haven't met criteria, like if they haven't shown up for sessions, if they've missed too many sessions. Goals can change throughout the course of treatment. So it is, again, at the client's request if they would like to be discharged or when their goals have been met and they feel that they're ready for that discharge. It's important. Why? Because we support the clients. We're establishing safety, trust, rapport. We're providing that psychoeducation. We're hopefully breaking traumatic patterns that have been perhaps generational. We're developing healthy coping skills and improving functioning. And we really want to reduce stress. I see Megan packed back on. So I'm going, and we might be running out of time. So I will turn it over to you, Megan. No, I would love to answer. I know you had some FAQs that folks asked, but Susan yeah. also asked in the comment, um, she's working with kids who have experienced or witnessed Stevie as a CASA, um, and she believes that counseling would be beneficial, but she doubts that her clients uh, could get him to your center. Are there online services or do we help with transportation? Yes, yes to both of those. So yes, we do virtual sessions as well as in-person sessions and it really is client preference. We do have a lot of clients who don't have transportation. We always wanna do what we can to remove any barriers. So yes, we would be able to um, see that client virtually if possible. We also are able to at times help with transportation. Um, it depends on the assistance that's needed and it's usually case by case, but that is a possibility as well. I'm sorry, I have dogs in the back end. Um, and I guess I, if anyone else has any other questions, but I think these questions on your FAQ are so important. So if you could walk through those as well, that would be great. Absolutely. So a lot of times we're asked, okay, this is fantastic. I, you know, I have somebody who could benefit from this. What is the fee for your services? Currently, we do not have a fee, which kind of sets us apart from some other agencies. We are grant funded through VOCA, which is the Victims of Crime Act, and that's through the Ohio Attorney General's Office. So at this time, all of our trauma therapy services and trauma services are free of charge. There is not a fee at this time. There is a wait list. We do get asked that often. And there is a wait list. Um, I don't want to say for a good reason, but you know, it's good and bad. First of all, we all know there's wait lists 
everywhere, right? Since the pandemic, there's been such an influx of people who are needing services. We also know that um, unfortunately, due to the specialty that, that we do provide, the pandemic put us a lot of clients, a lot of adults, a lot of children in homes and not able to get the help that they needed. So, right, we have more instances occurring. Our therapists are specialized in trauma, in domestic violence, in abuse, and those type of advocacy cells. So because it is so specialized, we do carry a wait list. Now that wait list does move, which is a good thing, right? As I said, we do not have a time limit for our services, but we're not looking to keep people in services longer than they need to be here. So once they come in, we're able to work through the modalities, we're able to help them reach their goals, and then we're able to take additional clients. So it does move. And what can you do to help? If you do know somebody, that was a great question previously, please refer them to us. Let us know what we can do to help. Have them call our helpline. Again, it's very important. They can come through a referral. They may have needs that you may not even be aware of that we could offer as we do have other programs besides trauma services within Journey. So please refer them to us, have them call our helpline. Um, it's also really important to be empathetic and not judgmental. And what goes with that is sincerity. I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody say, you know, I hear what you do. Why do they stay? Why don't you just tell them like, just get your stuff and go, right? It's a little bit judgmental, isn't it? We don't walk in anybody else's shoes, right? And it's also not trauma-informed. So just always be open-minded, listen, and be honest. It's There's nothing wrong with saying, this is a lot, this is pretty heavy. I don't know how to help you. Let me get you to somebody who does, right? And that's where you can make that referral to an expert. And then Jen, I know we only have another minute left, but we do have another question. And so someone sure. asked in the chat, do you help... Um... Do you have help for Hispanic people? And do we help folks that maybe don't have legal status in our therapy program? Yes. So I can answer quickly yes to both of those. So that is also, please call the helpline. Go ahead and they'll be able to help you and direct you to the right place. We do. We have um, Spanish speaking um, staff. We also have interpreters. We're also able to work with those that are not depending. It doesn't matter on their immigration status. Um, or their citizenship. So yes, we do have those. Just call our helpline and, and we can get you to the right place. Well, thank you so much.